me call us to worship this morning by reading Galatians 2, verses 19 and 20, where Paul says, For through the law I died to the law, so that I might live for God. I have been crucified with Christ, and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The life I now live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. Amen. Would you please stand and sing with us? Amazing love, I know it's 
true. It's my joy to honor you in all I do. I honor you because I'm forgiven because you were forsaken. I'm accepted. You were condemned. I'm alive and well. Your spirit is within me because you died and rose again. Amazing love, how can it be that you, my King, would die for me? Amazing love, I know it's true, and it's my joy to honor you. Amazing love, how can it be that you, my King, would die for me? Amazing love, I know it's true, and it's my joy to honor you in all I do.
One thing we've come to expect this time of year, when the first of the new year comes, when the first week uh, comes about, we expect a lot of the pundits to tell us what the future is going to hold. If you watch television or listen to radio, you'll be aware, I'm sure, that people will be asked, well, what do you expect in the year 2014? What's going to come? And uh, if you look back to the years that have already come and gone, you'll find that most of what they think is wrong. <laughs> the Chinese said a proverb, and it's pretty close to perfect. It says, prophecy is very difficult, especially as it concerns the future. <laughs> and it does. But this morning, I want to tell us as believers what we can be certain of, absolutely sure of, because God does know the future. He does know what he's planning on doing. He's not clairvoyant. He's not a soothsayer. He's not one of those necromancers who bring up the dead and ask them what the future holds. God's not like that. In fact, he condemns that. In his law, that's all condemned. The consultation with uh, those who pretend to know what is happening, uh, or maybe, I don't know, maybe do know some things because there's a spiritual realm out there. It's demonic, according to scripture, and very willing to deceive us, very ready to do so. But as far as the truth is concerned, God wants us to rely on him. He wants us to go back to his word. He wants us to listen. He wants us to heed. He wants us to hear. And his scriptures tell us what he plans to do. In fact, when you study prophecy in scripture, you'll know that when God says something about the future, it's because he knows what he plans to do in the future. God not being tied to time and space the way he's made us, but being outside of that realm in a way we can't explain, but he declares that he is. So he knows what his plans are. He knew them all from the first day. From all eternity, he knew exactly what he was planning to do. And since he's God, he had a plan that he would work out in perfection. So that when all was said and done, it would be true to say that all things work together. All things, not some things, not good things, not most things. All things work together for the good of those who love him. Not the good of those who defy him or deny him or distress him. It doesn't say that. It says, and he works everything for the good of those who love him and are the called according to his purpose. And I think that statement, a called according to his purpose, is simply an amplification of those who love him. Because what it means to love him is to have heard his voice. Maybe not audibly, nor even inwardly, but have a real sense that the scriptures are God-given. The Bible has come from on high, if we can use that expression, and the scriptures have been orchestrated, given to us, superintended by the Holy Spirit himself. And so if one's never had an emotional experience or a mystic experience, it really doesn't matter if you trust that the Bible is a true testimony to itself. The Bible says of itself, all scripture is God-breathed and it's profitable for all things. It's profitable to change our lives. It's intended for that purpose. And so, when it comes to biblical prophecy, as I said, the idea is that God is going to declare ahead of time what he plans to do in future time. And if you read in Isaiah, for instance, and you start in the middle of the 44th chapter and read on through the 7th verse of the next chapter, that's very clearly explained to us there. In the days of Isaiah, the nation of Israel was terror-stricken. The great nations around them were about to go to war, and that always meant trouble for Israel, who was sandwiched in between them. Most of those great nations, like Assyria or Egypt to the south, fought their battles on Israeli soil. And it wasn't beyond them to take control of that little nation. And the kings of Israel were always afraid. 
They were afraid that they would lose their power as kings and that the nation would be destroyed. And God was continually comforting them, saying, no, I took you out of Egypt with a mighty hand. That hand has not weakened. I took you out of Egypt and I can protect you. I protected you in the wilderness. He says to them over and over, Didn't, don't you remember when you were thirsty, I gave you drink from a rock. When you were hungry, I fed you with manna that you did not know where it came from. Don't you remember that after all those years, your shoes didn't wear out. Your clothing lasted. Why do you, he's asking them in, in effect, why do you think that's so? Of course, it's because I care for you. I was with you. I was guiding you. I was in that column of fire you saw in the day, and that pillar of, uh, pillar of smoke in the day, and that column of fire at night. And I was there. I led you all the way. I led you out of Egypt and to this land. Now I'm not going to leave you alone. I'm not going to abandon you. I'll discipline you. He tells Israel that. I will discipline you. I will punish you for your sin. I will make you account for what you're doing. But that's so you will grow closer to me. That's so you will be strengthened. That's so you will be more obedient. That's so you will know me better. That was the purpose. And in order that they might know that this isn't just talk, he gives to the Israelites a sign. He gives it to the king. He gives them a sign. He says, there will be a day when Jerusalem is built. And when the cities of Judah are all built up, in that day I will raise up a savior, a deliverer, a redeemer. I'll tell you his name. His name will be Cyrus. Cyrus will come and he will accomplish all that I am promising you because I am a Lord. Now when we're aware of the days that when Isaiah lived and the circumstances in Isaiah's time when he was living, we'll wonder what Isaiah thought when he heard those words. Because uh, Jerusalem was still standing. The towns of Judah were still inhabited. Nothing had happened yet. Yes, they were afraid. They feared the worst, and they had good reason. But it certainly had not come to pass that they were demolished in any way. But eventually they were. The city was torn down. The temple was destroyed. The city was ransacked and burned with fire. The walls were built, uh, torn down. The gates were destroyed. Everything, everything went. And the uh, people were deported to Babylon, made slaves in Babylon, were under the authority of the king of Babylon, no longer under people like David and Solomon and Saul and all the other kings of Egypt. No. But at the end of time, a king came out of Persia, and his name was Cyrus. And Cyrus wrote an edict after he conquered Babylon. And his edict said, let these Jewish people go back to their homeland. And let them rebuild their city. And let them re-inhabit their lands. And let them rebuild their walls. And let them restore their gates. And that was almost 200 years after Isaiah lived and spoke those words. And if you go back and read that portion carefully, you will see that God says this word will come true because I will accomplish it. I will accomplish it. In other words, you may not be here in the future, this generation that hears the promise, but a generation will follow you and they will be there, but I do not die I will always be, I am who I am. And what I, I, I will be with them as I have been with you. And when the day comes, I will fulfill my word. I say that to ask ourselves a question. If, you, if you're a believer, and it really doesn't hold for unbelievers, but I hope if you don't believe, you might think about the consequences of that even this morning. But if you are in Christ, and that means if you are in connection with Christ, and that means if you have faith in Christ, because that's the only connecting tissue there is on earth. There is no other way to be connected to Jesus Christ than by faith. You can't produce the kind of works that he demands. You can't live the kind of life that he requires. You can't do it. I can't do it. No one can do it. All have sinned. We've sinned and fall short of the glory of God. There's none righteous. No, not one. So there's no road to him that way. 
The only way is to step on the road he's provided. He's provided a pathway right into his presence. He, Jesus said, I'm the way. I'm the path. I'm the truth. Come to me. You heavy laden? Come to me. You burdened down? Come to me. I'm meek. I am lowly in heart. What does that mean? I'll take anybody. I don't care how bad it is. I don't care how bad you are or think you are or what you've done or what you fear. I'm meek and I'm lowly in heart. You come to me. You will find rest to your souls because my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Why? Because we might not carry our own cross and die for him. Of course we might. But he'll be with us. And he will make us able to bear what he calls us to bear. We'll be in yoke with him. When oxen were put in a yoke, they carried the weight together. Both of them carried it. And a yoke made it easier than if one were carrying it alone. He says, take my yoke upon you. Learn from me, for I am meek and lowly in heart. You'll find rest to your souls. My yoke is easy and my burden is light. And so, what then do those who have received that have said, yes, yes, you're talking to me. You're talking to me. I feel that weight. I'm a little afraid of the future. I don't know what my, I don't know if I can handle it. I don't know what the future holds in this country or this world. I don't know. And you say, but I want to know. I want to have some sense of settled assurance of what will become of me. And as I say, there'll be a lot of guesses, a lot of guesses, on partic in particularly this week. And as if you listen to the newscasters, they'll bring them all forward. Well, I went and proved to myself that the Chinese are right anyway. The prophecy is indeed very difficult, especially the future especially the future. And I went and got my old high school yearbook. And one of the, one of the pages in there, it probably is still in high school yearbooks, I don't read them every year. But I took mine out and looked at class prophecies. And I looked at what we thought, or those that did the prophesying thought we would become only 10 years down the road. It wasn't for 2017 or 14 or 2000, it was 1967, because I graduated in 57. And it was only looking, ten, that's easy, 10 years down the road, piece of cake. And I didn't read one that was right. <laughs> of all the people, at least that I know in my class and still have contact with, absolutely none of them were right. Especially mine. Way off target. Nobody ever guessed that I would be standing in a pulpit anywhere. <laughs> Not in 1957. No, the Chinese have it right, but they're wrong if they're talking about God. Because God knows exactly where we will be ages from now, eons from now, a thousand, thousand years from now, and he's told us so. And I'd like us to just think about that a little bit this morning. What he's told us is this, that we will be his exact image. We will bear his image. That's why we were made. We were not beasts of the field. We were not birds of the air. We're not fish that swim in the sea. We were drafted out of the earth and made in the image of the one who made us. That's why we exist as human beings. We exist as human beings that God might have his image in the created order that one can come to someone or something inside the creation that tells them who God really is and exposes what God is really like. That's what an image is. When you stand in front of a mirror, you see your image. You can see, at least in the material sense, the outward sense, who you are and what you are like. God, of course, is not just interested in what we look like on the outside. His real interest is that we mirror him on the inside. That's what it really means to bear the image of God in its fullness. When we talk about the image of God, it's wise to divide the issue in this sense. There is in us, or there is in the way we're made, his structural image. 
What do I mean by that? His structural image. Well, God is personal. God is a person. He has a name. Yahweh. That's God's name. He revealed it. He told who he is. He is I am. I am who I am. A personal name. He spoke about himself all through the scriptures in that light. For example, when you come to Psalm 8. Psalm 8, O oh Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. There are two words used there for Lord. You wouldn't know it in English because it's translated. But the first one is a personal name. O oh Lord, O oh Yahweh, O oh my God, my, this person I've come to know. You are the Lord, Adonai, God the Lord. O oh Lord, my Adonai, my God, my Lord. And it's this name that God in his grace has communicated to us who are his image bearers because we are personal too. He made us persons as he is personal. He gave us the capacity to know. God has all knowledge. We can receive knowledge and we can think about it. We can contemplate it. We can use knowledge. These are structural things. When you go through all the attributes that we have, we can speak words, we hear words. God is the word. This is structural. And that has not been totally damaged by, at, at all. Yes, some of persons can lose their hearing, some can lose sight, some can lose an aspect of that. But human beings basically are still human beings. And we have this reality about us. We are personal, we are willful, we are knowing. These are structural matters that one has whether or not they are a believer in God or a believer in Christ. But then there's the moral image. Yes, you can call it that. There is that inward reality. There is, there is that attitude of heart and mind. There is that, that inward uh, attitude or aspect to the image of God. And I'm thinking about our obedience. I'm thinking about our desire to love one another, to serve one another, to be, give up our life for one another. These, this inwardness of God, because that's what God is like. God the Son said, it's in Hebrews, he said, a body you have prepared for me. For what purpose? That I might sacrifice it. And I might sacrifice this body you've given me that I might create a new body. Not just my own single body that I came forth with from Mary's womb, but an entire race of people who are my body. My body. The body of Christ. And this attitude of love and self-sacrifice is meant to be the attitude we have. It's part of being in the image of God. In fact, it is part of that inward, uh, inward reality that God created in us in Eden, but lost it when our forefather sinned against him and disobeyed. Jesus, according to Hebrews, is the exact image of the invisible God. If we were to take time to read the first two chapters of Hebrews, what we would read is this. He is the image of of the invisible God. In past times, God spoke in many ways and in various places. I guess we could say he spoke in bits and pieces. He spoke here in Isaiah, there in Jeremiah, there in Moses. He spoke in many and various ways. But in these last days, these are the days we live in. We live in the last days. He has spoken to us by a son. One person comes with his final word. This person is a remarkable one. It says in Hebrews, who created us, who created the world we live in. Our creator came to us in this person. And this person take, took on flesh for another purpose, and that was to redeem and restore us to himself. And he is God's son. Son in the scriptural sense means I'm the one who again bears that image. A son is in the likeness of his father. And he is the son. And then a question is asked, a question that comes really out of the eighth psalm. To what angel did God ever say, you are my son, 
Today I have begotten you. And actually, I quote it wrong. If you look it up, you'll find it in the second psalm. The second psalm asks the question, Oh God, oh Lord, you know, uh, to what person did God ever say you are my son? And God is saying, well, the one that is my son, I have enthroned in the heavens. I have placed him on high. The Lord is the king because God says, my king is on Zion, my holy hill. But when it comes to this eighth psalm, in the eighth psalm, the description of man as we are meant to be and in Christ will be is shown to us. Psalm 8, O Lord, my Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. You have set your glory above the heavens. From the lips of children and infants you have ordained praise because of your enemies, because of the avenger. When I consider the heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you have established, what is man? What is man that you are mindful of him and the son of man that you care for him? You have made him a little lower than the angels, but you have crowned him with glory and honor. You have made him the ruler of the works of your hands. You put everything under his feet, all sheep and oxen, the birds of the air, the fish of the sea, all that swims along the paths of the sea. O oh Lord, my Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. That's a marvelous psalm. It's about the image bearing of us as image bearers of God. But now, we're here in 2014. We're looking at one another. We'll leave here and go out and see people in our neighborhood and on the street. Who looks like this? Who is it that has this rule, this authority? Who is it that has this image? Right now, we may be coming like that. We may be, be being shaped into it. But there is one who has already arrived. And that's what the author of Hebrews says. Because the author of Hebrews quotes this text in the second chapter. And in the second chapter, the author of Hebrews says, Now, we do not yet see these things as a reality. And it's true. I'm sure that if we walked to the seashore and commanded the fish to come in, they probably won't. If we told the birds of the air where to go, they probably will stay on their course. In other words, we somehow are to rule the created order, but it doesn't look like it presently. Presently, it looks like the created order has the upper hand. And if we don't know who Christ is and where he is and what he has done, we may well despair that the Christian gospel has any truth at all. But if you believe in Christ, if you believe that he is the one sent by the Father for our sakes to bear away our sin in his body on that tree, if you believe that he rose from the dead, he has ascended to heaven, that he sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty, that the day will come when he will come and he will raise those who have died, those who have believed in him will be restored to him, then he will give all those who trust him a part to play in his new kingdom, in the world or the kingdom that was prepared before the world was ever made. If you believe that, then the author of Hebrews is saying, really, in that second chapter, we do not yet see these things, but we see Jesus, who for a little while was made lower than the angels, that he might redeem those who are on this earth in their sin and guilt and need his restoration. And so I would say this morning that the pundits probably have no idea what 2014 will bring, I know that my classmates had no idea what 1967 would bring, but I know this, that if you are in Jesus Christ, the day will come, a future day, when you are just like him. When every single thing that is true of Jesus Christ will be true of you. That is a fact of history. 
It was decided before history even began. It was decided when God called the first molecule into being. And the question of the present age is, do you trust him? Do you belong to him? Are you connected to him? Is he your Lord? Can you say with the psalmist, O oh Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. Let's pray. Father, when we talk about image bearing, it's, it's really a difficulty. Uh, it's a difficulty because we're not sure exactly how we are to contemplate and how to understand what it means to be in the image of an invisible God. And certainly it is true that we are persons, we think thoughts, we do deeds, we in that sense are like you because you are personal even if invisible, you are knowledgeable even though your knowledge is hidden from us because it's not openly shown until you reveal it. But we know that what's really happening in the present order of things is that we are being changed from glory to glory, from faith to faith. We are growing. And we're certain of this, that you did not reveal these things for no reason. You revealed what the future is by showing us who your son not only is, but what he has become of him in order that we might know what is true of us in him and what will become of us. So we pray that in this year that's upcoming, that we will be drawn closer to you and more conformable to him. We ask this in Christ's name. Amen. Your guilty fears and rise.